But before we start, I just want to give you a little bit of background about this panel, which is um, born from the idea that uh, I think it was Trisha Cruz was telling Kevin at a, a meeting recently that um, at the last IDCC meeting, which was in San Francisco last year, that um, the CDL hosted, which I used to work for, I'm Carly Strasser, um, the, uh, there was kind of this uh, feeling in the room, maybe after a couple of glasses of wine, that uh, it feels like things aren't moving along as quickly as maybe they, they should be or they could be, and um, why that might be. So just a, a bit of a feeling of frustration about the pace of how things are changing in the digital curation world and in the library sciences and in the um, data archiving world. Um, and how do, we, how do we move that forward? Um, so Tricia uh, Cruz told, told Kevin that I had opinions on this, and Kevin asked me to organize a panel. So I'm going to try and keep my opinions to a minimum, um, but if you want to hear them, I'm happy to share those with you uh, over, over a beer somewhere. Uh, but I assembled this group of people to help kind of um, facilitate this discussion. So um, a couple of things. Uh, there's a lot of panelists. There's six people up here, and they're all super great. And we're going to hear from all of them. Uh, but what that means is that not everybody's going to um, get to talk a ton. So um, it'll be up to you to allow this panel to facilitate and kind of seed discussions that maybe you'll have over the next couple of days, either with each other or with these panelists, and to really start moving this conversation forward on how we can start making real progress um, in an in a earnest way that um, maybe uh, we're not accomplishing at the rate that we would all like it to be happening at. Um, so allow this to stimulate your discussions, and uh, when we do uh, get to the portion where you guys are going to um, ask questions and provide feedback, that'll be the last 15 minutes of this hour, then um, when you do talk, please make sure that you say your name and where you're from, just so we can understand what your perspective is in this world. And um, so with that, I'm going to introduce myself and um, tell you a little bit about the folks that are on the stage, and then give them all a couple of minutes to say their piece and then ask them a few questions and let them all kind of answer as they see fit, and then we'll allow you guys to um, participate as well. So, first, I'm Carly Strasser. I'm um, the relatively new uh, manager of strategic partnerships for Datasite. So um, I've been with the California Digital Library for the last three years working on tools and services there. And um, now I'm, I'm with the Datasite organization thinking about um, kind of long-term goals and progress and, and partnerships. Um, and the people up here, let's see, they're out of order, so this will be fun. All right, so first we have Torsten here, and um, he's from Imperial College London. So um, he's a project manager um, thinking about open access and research data management. So he manages the cross-college activities on um, open access and research data management. And before that, he oversaw infrastructure programs at JISC, which we've heard a lot about today. And his background is in the digital humanities and e-research. And he's worked for um, libraries as well as the private sector. So he brings um, a couple of different perspectives to this discussion that I think will be useful. Let's see, next we have Constance, and she's from University of Cologne, and she's a postdoc and a, a data manager for the Collaborative Research Center at the University of Cologne Institute of Geography and Regional Computing Center. And so her background is geoinformatics, and she has a PhD in geography. So um, that means that she's going to bring a bit of a researcher perspective to this discussion, as well as a data manager and archivist perspective. And her thesis was actually on the design and implementation of a research data management system for an interdisciplinary long-term CRC focused on soil, vegetation, and atmosphere data. All right, next we have the top. Uh, we have Lawrence, and Lawrence is from the London School of Economics and Political Science. He's a data librarian, and he works on the establishment of research data management support services. And before that, he, um, I'm going to so butcher this, uh, he worked on research data management and training and support for the CESDA training at Geisys. Which was in the Leibniz. Say it again, the what institute? Yes, yes, that one. Okay. <laughs> For social sciences. Uh, so I'm still learning to pronounce all these fun European um, phrases in my new role as a data site person. Uh, and, um, and he thinks of data management and support and preparing data for reuse at the UK um, data archive before he was at the um, place that I can't say the name of. Okay, next up we have Tim. Scrolling. Okay, Tim is at Johns Hopkins Libraries. He's a digital library architect, and he splits his time between two uh, roles at the libraries at Johns Hopkins. Um, one is a digital library architect, 
and the uh, Digital Research and Curation Center, and he helps think about kind of that infrastructure angle of things, um, provides digital preservation expertise for a variety of projects, including the Data Conservancy and the RMAP project. And he's also the technical consultant um, for the Research Data Management Services, helping implement and operationalize the Johns Hopkins University Data Archive. Next up, we have Amy, and Amy is um, similar to Constance, where she has a, a PhD in a, in a science, also myself. She's a science data librarian at Stanford Libraries and um, works with the Stanford research community on improving research data management, and in particular, preserving and sharing research data um, through their digital repository there. And her background is molecular, molecular biophysics and biochemistry from Yale, and before she was at the library, she was in the biotech industry. And then last but not least, we have Jeff down at the end there, and he works for Crossref as the Director of Strategic Initiatives. Uh, we actually tried to get my title to be the Manager of Strategic Initiatives so that we could have some sort of parallel in our titles, but it didn't fly, so I'm Manager of Strategic Partnerships instead, but it's very similar. Um, and so he's thinking about that things, those things in terms of cross, excuse me, Crossref, and um, that's the uh, organization that um, helps uh, publishers provide DOIs for um, their materials that they produce. And um, so before he was uh, the publishing technology consultant at Scholarly Information Strategies, where he consulted extensively with publishers and librarians on emerging technologies and how they affect scholarly and professional researchers. Um, he was also CTO at a scholarly publishing firm and head of an IT R&D mo at Monitor Group in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and co-founded Brown University's scholarly technology group in 1993. She has over 18, 18 years of experience as a tech leader in scholarly technology. So um, this is a great distinguished panel here, which I'm sure has loads of opinions on why it's taking so long. And I'm gonna let them um, give a couple of minutes of an opening statement, and I'll give it to you first, Torsten. Do you Thank want you. This or do you want that? Oh, I can take this one. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's great to be able to speak here. I think the first question that we need to ask ourselves when we say, why is it going so slow? Is it actually going so slow? And then the question is, how do you benchmark that? So what would fast be like? I don't have a sort of a proper scientific answer, but my sort of improper answer is, um, when I go to conferences, do I hear the same problems being presented and the same answer given, and then the same thing comes up the year after, and you think, I thought we sort of had covered that. Why isn't it implemented yet? That could be a sign to be taken that things are maybe not quite as fast going as you think they should be. And um, I don't know about you, but I on occasion have that feeling that we kind of get this thing where we kind of thought, well, haven't we sort of covered this before? Then I thought, um, maybe it's actually best uh, to get a different view. So I've asked a few colleagues who haven't been at IDCC and so on. So can you tell me what your view is as someone who maybe hasn't engaged that much? What, why actually is it going so slow? And I got two interesting answers that seem to completely contradict themselves. One answer was, um, well, the reason is money. If we had enough money thrown at this, we could just make everything super easy. We'd have great infrastructure. Everything would be supportive. We'd bribe researchers and taking part. Everything would be done easy. The other answer was, no, it's not going very slow at all. We're just facing a massive culture change. And considering how difficult it is, it's actually going relatively fast. Now, I think they both sort of have a point, but at the time when I was kind of writing my notes, I looked at my smartphone that was lying on the desk, and I felt smartphones are actually still relatively expensive. Um, so there's, there's a cost people have to pay money to get them. Um, but we've seen a massive culture change triggered by the smartphone and how people use these devices. And I think the reason why people have picked up smartphones and are actually happy to pay money for getting something is because the feeling is the cost-benefit ratio is right. You pay something and it completely changes the way how you use your phone because you stop actually using it as a phone. And you're quite happy to do that because you get something back. When you ask researchers the same question, at least at my institution, or even ask the institution, then the comment seems to be the cost-benefit ratio isn't right. There's lots of effort um, that we have to put into it. And what are we actually getting out of it? So there's a feeling we're not maybe getting as much out of it. This can be either perceived or it can be correct, but I think it's something kind of that we need to tackle. So I kind of thought, what would be things that people would like to get out of it? And <clears throat> to say something more positive sort of towards the end of my two minutes, I think there are probably three things that we could tackle <clears throat> that researchers and institutions in particular would be interested in. <clears throat> Number one, what researchers really care about is grants. 
If it was clear that research funders would be seen as serious on this topic, would require DMPs, would maybe check later on what happened, and make sure you can only get a follow-on grant <coughs> if you've met all the requirements, that's the point when we get a very large number of researchers knocking on our door and saying, what do we need to do here? <coughs> the second thing is publications. If all journals and all publications would just say, you have to deposit all the data that are cited and referenced that someone needs to have, again, at that point, I think colleagues in the library will get loads of researchers coming to them and say, so how can we do this right from the start of the project? And the third thing is, and that goes after I've appointed as funders and publishers, final thing, going back to the institutions, if institutions would say, we are tying this all into career progression, and we're not actually progressing your career until you can demonstrate that you meet best practice of research data management, then we probably also would get more movement. And I think my two minutes are probably up. They are. That's all right, though. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thanks for being here. Um, I would start from another perspective, from the, as everybody knows, the problems and challenges of research data management um, that are quite discussed in literature, like scientists have no time to uh, upload the data or they don't have the infrastructure. And as everybody knows, all scientists agree to share the data. But in practice, um, this is not always the case. And this is also the same, or also my experience as a data manager in this collaborative research center, which is very interdisciplinary and runs for 12 years. Um, so, as you know, in collaborative research, it is very important to or essential to share the data because other people are dependent on the data. And yeah, um, and looking for from my perspective also data management in this project, um, it is my experience that some people really like to share the data and others don't want to share the data. Um, for example, they tell me that they I have no time to prepare the data or no time to process it or upload it. Um, and I think this is one part where we have to start. We have to change the rethinking of the scientists that they get more familiar with research data management. Um, we have to provide more training and guidance and prevent... Uh, yeah, just tell the researchers that research data management is important and that we have to integrate it into their um, usual daily um, work. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I was asked to speak here, and the three things to think about uh, were timing, progress, and frustrations. So, regarding timing, um, this is new and it isn't new at the same time. Replication is as old as science itself. Um, national archives and libraries um, go back decades, if not centuries. We also have data archives that have been around since the 1960s. Um, IASIST, official supporters of IDCC15, um, has just celebrated its 40th birthday. And books and papers were written in the 1980s on um, data sharing. Some were written by people in this room today. Um, so. It's not new, but it also is new in the sense we're finally at the point where technology and the economics of data sharing are um, beginning to work on a, a mass scale. And given that, there'll always be a cultural lag effect, I think, that will take time to catch up. Um, regarding progress, um, we are trying to change a culture. That's been mentioned a number of times already today. Um, we're trying to change the way people build careers and progress within those careers. And there'll always be resistance to that, I think. Um, Regarding that, possibly we focus too much on the rational arguments for these things, um, which are often things that trigger emotional responses in researchers or people in general. So I think perhaps we need to work more on approaches that understand human behaviour a bit, um, particularly in regarding to framing messages and support messages. Um, thinking about this, an example I had was that um, from political science, we all know that an individual's vote doesn't usually change a general election result. Um, so your vote effectively doesn't matter. Um, but people still vote. At the same time with data, we could, it's fair to say perhaps that all those um, social psychology data sets based on um, undergraduates at universities, you know, paid five pound for an hour, those data sets probably won't be looked at ever again. Um, 
So what's the difference? And I think it's, that's possibly something to do with social norms. We tend to vote because we're expected to by family and friends and so on. But research, we're not at that point yet. There isn't that sort of pressure on researchers to share um, and to judge them perhaps as individuals rather than as a community. Frustrations. Um, my impression seems to be that technological barriers are easier to overcome in some ways than the political ones, although I'm not a technology person, so you can infer my biases there, perhaps. Um, we're getting technological infrastructure in place for preservation, citability, and discovery, but the resistance to me still seems to be re rooted in attitudes and behaviours. And that resistance isn't necessarily researcher-based, but also um, primarily, I think, or an element of it is resource and bureaucracy-based. So the, uh, a couple of the things that I was going to talk about have already been covered, so I'll use this time to, uh, to dig in a little bit about some of the, the issues I see that are, are not necessarily, uh, not necessarily uh, about particular frustrations or, or progress, but, but are about the landscape. Uh, I think what we have is uh, a variety of sharehold, uh, uh, stakeholders we have uh, we have the public, that's both taxpayers and potential consumers of data, funders, uh, institutions, researchers. Uh, they're they have overlapping uh, interests, but they're not necessarily well aligned, um, and there's really no consensus about which issues have to be tackled first. But even within each of those. Uh, groupings of stakeholders, there are communities which have their own levels of sophistication with regard to, to data management. And so on the timing issue, uh, you know, we're going very fast and we're going very slow. Uh, some communities are, are moving very quickly and are very sophisticated and others aren't. And there are a variety of cultures and stakeholders and trying to move those along at the at a common pace uh, and in the right sequence, I think is another challenge uh, that we're facing. I think another issue that we have is, um, this was mentioned before, that there are only a few points of enforcement. And Tony mentioned that I think it was 86% um, after there was, you, you don't get another grant until uh, you, you uh, have your data released and available. Um, and I would guess that a large portion of that uh, that missing 14 percent is uh, people who never are going to come back, and so their their data is lost because there's never any enforcement mechanism. So uh, using institutions potentially to to deal with that kind of issue, you don't get your uh, you don't get your degree. Uh, and you, or you don't advance in your career, as was mentioned earlier, I think are, are good ways to start dealing with that. And the last thing that I'd like to talk about is vocabulary, uh, how we talk about things. Uh, our community is using different terminology to describe the same things, using the same terminology to describe different things all the time. And it makes it impossible for us to understand the gaps and uh, to, to figure out which areas are most ripe for redress. Uh, and it also makes uh, stakeholders further down the chain who, who are not as focused on the, the data management part but just want to get their research done, it makes them frustrated because we're all saying different things. So again, the as Tim said, some other people have said some things that I was going to say, not that I won't say all of those, but um, so I think I probably fall on the side of someone who thinks that this isn't really moving that slowly. Um, science has been done essentially the same way for hundreds of years, and the culture is very similar. Um, technology, on the other hand, has changed dramatically since I started graduate school in 1993. Um, the conversations I have with students about what they do and what they need to be doing are so different than anything that I did and needed to be needed to be doing. Um, that the technology is just kind of outpacing the cultural change right now. Um, I see cultural changes shifting, particularly in the younger, in the graduate students and, and postdocs. Um, but it's just taking some time to catch up. And 
I think if if our goal is sort of helping that catch up, that culture change catch up, then part of what we need to be doing is is shifting a little bit of how we're having these conversations with people. So um, Jeffrey Bolton mentioned earlier uh, developing a narrative about what research is going to look like in the future, and and explaining to researchers about how what we're trying to do will support that. And I would argue that that we need to have that conversation from the perspective of asking them what their research is going to look like in the future and what we can do to help support them with doing those things. Um, it may not, in the end, be different things, but it comes across very differently to people um, when you present it a little differently like that. Um, there are a lot of points that I see researchers having problems with, the things that they tell, that they tell me that they need, um, that that we aren't providing, aren't looking at providing. You know, we say, but this is this is uh, the library I work at. At any rate, which I have only been there two and a half years, um, and it's my sole experience in libraries. But there's a tendency to say, you know, these are the things that we want to do, and this is how we want to help them. Instead of asking, instead of really finding out what they need. If we want to work with them, then we really need to figure out what they need and and make it work for them, um, make it fit with how they do research and the things they want to do instead of trying to change how they do things. Okay, so I definitely come down on the uh, too slow camp. Um, and I think the reason for this is, 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 is uh, at least in my mind, pretty clear. I uh, routinely get invited to various workshops and meetings um, to talk about the future of scholarly publication and communication. And this has been going on for some time now. It was interesting when Tony Hay put up this slide uh, that showed the, uh, the picture that Bill Gates presented at this uh, presentation. Um, because it showed, you know, the, the kind of thing that we all fantasize about, this fantastic, rich document with a graphic in it that clearly you could spin in 3D and extract the data from with annotations down the sides and comments and a rating system, uh, you know, a truly interactive experience, the future of scholarship. And I keep getting invited to meetings where we talk about these things, you know, how are we going to communicate in the future? And inevitably, the meeting starts off with these grandiose plans and then it sort of slowly descends within about half an hour into lamentations about the fact that people can't actually even figure out where to upload their data or get an identifier or, uh, you know, or collect the metadata for something. So these grand plans that we have inevitably get mired in the mundane. They get stopped because the infrastructure isn't there. And so for a very long time, I've been trying to figure out what are the things that seem to be prohibiting, what, what, what are the things that seem to be stopping us from creating an infrastructure that can apply in the same way that a lot of the sort of uh, analog infrastructure that we use daily uh, applies to scholars all over. Um, and I've started to think about some of the anti-patterns that we see when we're trying to uh, build scholarly cyber infrastructure. Uh, the first one simply is the funding pattern. Um, can you imagine if electricity and water were funded on a grant cycle? Uh, that would be a pretty frustrating experience. Your grant ends, the lights go out, the water gets cut off. Um, this isn't a way to fund infrastructure, and yet routinely uh, we try and fund infrastructure on grant cycles. And so what we see is often a, you know, a funder uh, will come in and will say, uh, we have a tranche of money. Now, let me just ask you a question. If you're a researcher and you're studying A, and a funder comes out with a, a, a tranche of money to study B, uh, what do you do? You say, well, I'm going to propose something that connects A to B, clearly. And if B is infrastructure, you're going to have a lot of researchers who are going to be trying to get money to fund their research. And they will promise, promise, that as a side effect of that, you'll get some infrastructure. Now, I see this time and time again. It's sort of like promising to build a bike shed and, as a side effect, get an electricity grid and a railroad system. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked. And this actually is a symptom of another pattern that happens, which is that if you think about it, fundamentally, I think, you know, researchers, they're concerned with the cutting edge. They're concerned with pushing boundaries. They're concerned with doing the things that nobody else is doing. And yet, we're sitting here asking them to think about, and this is a rude way of saying stewardship, but janitorial services. 
We're asking them to actually think heavily about the kind of stuff that temperamentally they do not care about. And I think that this is another root cause of what's happening. I think that another anti-pattern that we have is that if you look at the infrastructure that works, if the infrastructure that we depend on, um, it crosses all sorts of boundaries. Research crosses boundaries. It crosses institutional boundaries, global boundaries. Um, it certainly crosses funders. And yet what happens is we try and create infrastructure that is specific to a particular institution or a particular discipline or a particular funder. And research is incre increasingly transcends all of these things. So I think that there are sort of a set of fundamental anti-patterns that we keep following and trying to create infrastructure that can be used by all researchers to do even the most basic things. Just get your data up there, give it an identifier, give it metadata. It's not easy enough. We don't have the equivalent of a Dropbox or something that people can use to do this. And as long as we don't have that fundamental thing, we can't move on to do the more exciting stuff that people all want to do uh, in scholarly communication. Okay, thanks you guys. Um, most of you did okay. I'll scold the others for going over two minutes later. Um, so uh, the next little bit is um, maybe for about 17 minutes. I'm a taskmaster. <laughs> We're going to um, ask some questions and let them uh, answer them as um, they want. I'm not going to require everybody on the panel to answer every question, but um, if you feel passionately about things, then um, please speak up. So um, the first question I have is about um, carrots versus sticks. This is something that keeps coming up all the time in um, several of the talks today and certainly in the tweet stream. Um, what should we be doing to incentivize this that we're not already doing? And um, are funder mandates the way to go? Does anybody want to open that up? Well, you got, you got your mic. Go for it. Um, I would like to say I don't think that's the right question, Carly. Why, thank you, Amy. I appreciate your feedback. Why don't you elaborate? Um, actually, this actually reminds me of, this was something that in the discussion in Tony's um, presentation, that I think the carrot and the stick are both uh, whys that are subsumed by the how, which is make it easy. If it's easy, they will do it. I have people who tell me, you know, I'm, I have to share this data because it's now required from this current grant. That other data, I am sharing it with people, not in a you know, in a kind of one-off way, but it's it's a pain in the neck. Literally said, pain in the it's a pain in the neck. So I'm not I'm not going to do that. So Jeff, did you want to add something? Yeah. And if you uh, if you make it easy and you make it um, uh, you know make it easy to do something that's actually worthwhile, uh, the dichotomy does fall apart. We can just call them carrot sticks and be done with it. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> Torsten. Well, I mean, to, an <clears throat> to an extent, I think it doesn't really matter so much which of the two we use, but we should be careful that they are designed in the way that they actually work. And we've seen funder mandates that have been really effective. There have been lots of complaints about <clears throat> Hefke UK funder and their open access mandate because it forces all the universities to do things that they maybe <clears throat> haven't been so keen on, and I'm also complaining about it, but it actually did get us moving. If you then look at data management plans, this has come up earlier, some funders require you to have one, but they don't want to see it. Others sort of look at it, but nothing really ever happens. I mean, we've recently done some um, surveying across the university to get a view of what happens with data management plans. And the number of people who actually write one isn't very large. The number of people who, after they've written it, actually do anything with it, also not very large at all. <laughs> and I think that kind of shows you can have a stick, but you should make a stick that actually works. Otherwise, you only annoy people. They do the minimum necessary to comply, the absolute minimum on paper, and then they just move on. I'm not quite sure that's really helping. Tim, did you want to add something? Yeah, well, uh, two things. The first is that there's, you know, there's some issue about carrots and sticks, that uh, carrots actually were hung on sticks. So you know, maybe sticks weren't to beat people with. Uh, but the second thing is about requirements versus enforcement of requirements. So the sticks we have, we don't, uh, often we don't apply them uh, as sticks or they're not perceived as sticks or they're not perceived as a big enough stick uh, by the people you need to, to actually do something. So there need to be enforcement mechanisms. I mentioned this before. Um, so obviously review is useful at the beginning, but some kind of mechanism where you can actually ensure that there's some kind of um, uh, some kind of follow-up if if uh, some work is not done, and I think I think alignment uh, of interest is probably a better way 
uh, of getting things done. So there's not this this idea of a a punitive mechanism, but actually getting some agreement and focus on the things that are most critical to do next. Anyone else? Yeah. Okay. So I was just going to say, um, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, we all know we've had the um, policies in the UK um, for quite a while now from the funders, um, but also I think we're seeing more of um, my favourite vegetable-based metaphor becoming apparent. Um, things like data site ORCID, DOIs and so on are actually something you can sell to researchers to get them. It's a positive way to get them into um, archiving data or data management. The other thing as well that hasn't been mentioned is um, academic journals are finally beginning to address um, data policies. Um, they're not doing it very well overall, I think. Um, maybe that's an area we're failing in support. Um, inconsistency about pre or post availability in different embargo periods and so on. And then there's the whole question of enforcement. Um, but the two things researchers care about are money and publications. So if they're being attacked in, if you like, from both sides there, then that should hopefully help change the culture a little bit. Great. Do you want to say maybe, something? Maybe tell something from, a, from the German perspective. Um, I agree. Uh, Mr. Thorsten, that um, so in Germany, some funding agencies also request data management plans, but unfortunately, some also don't get checked. But there's some funding agencies like the um, German Federal Ministry for Education, and they tell you if you don't provide the data, that you're not going to be funded later on, so they credit. And also concerning the enforcement mechanisms, I could speak from my project um, where we have trouble or problems that people give the data to our data management system. And what we have integrated that all PhD students, for example, who want to have their um, certificate for the integrated research school, um, they have to provide the data to our system to get their certificate. certificate. So we also kind of force them to give the data to the data management system. Jeff? So one thing I, I, I see increasingly is a lot of people saying, well, if we can't um, get the funders to force them to do this or we can't get the institution to uh, uh, force researchers to do this, uh, maybe the publishers will force uh, researchers to do this. And I think, I think it, um, uh, um, it probably... Uh, people are giving publishers a bit too much um, uh, credit in this. They, they can't really force researchers to do this any more than anybody else can force researchers to do this. And the reason they can is because um, if they did so without showing the researchers some sort of benefit immediately, um, they, would, they would just never hear the end of it. Publishers are very loath to ask researchers uh, to add to the burden. And, and I think increasingly they're very concerned that they're being, you know, that, that this, this, this admittedly critical point um, where somebody is submitting something to get published is, is the place where they, we have to get them to jump over every hurdle on earth without giving them a clear view of what benefits there are going to be. So um, I'd caution uh, people in thinking about you know, uh, publishers enforcing this uh, without actually um, giving some sense that it's going to help them uh, in, in some meaningful way quickly. Awesome. Tim? One more follow-up. One, one of the things, I think you know, publishers and, and funders, as has, has been mentioned, are those are sort of key gateways for getting this kind of uh, data out of out of the researchers, but I, I think there's I, th I think there is some value uh, in using a publisher uh, as a bludgeon, I guess, uh, in that way, in the same way we use the funder long enough uh, for us to to do something that shows the researcher some value, so you know something that they see as just a, a pain in the butt becomes uh, a real carrot, you know, something that they're interested in. And I think projects like Genome Database, Protein Databank, Protein Databank, um, you know, those have demonstrated value and people have bought in now and now there won't be a problem. And the same kind of thing has happened in earth science. Okay. Um, there's some speculation on Twitter as to how far we can carry this metaphor of carrots and sticks. Which is, uh, I'm, I think there's some kind of like a there's like a ranch dressing on your carrot stick to make it. I can't. I'm not sure what the analogy is here, but yeah, I want to ask about data citation because it is often pointed out as um, a potential incentive, aka carrot. But um, 
Uh, data citation maybe is not catching on as quickly as some of us would like, or maybe um, Amy thinks it's, it's going along just fine, but <laughs> I would love to hear uh, thoughts on the panel about data citation, which is near and dear to my heart since I work for data cite. Why it's taking so long, why it's not being picked up as quickly as maybe um, we'd like it to. Are you calling me out? Sure. <laughs> um, actually, I would say that most of the researchers that I talk to, and I talk to a lot of them over the course of my work, um, you know, in historically, citing the paper was equivalent to citing the data. And for a lot of researchers, most of their data is still um, attached to, associated with the publication. Sometimes there isn't there isn't further data. There's not a separate data set. But even if there is, it's still inherently linked to the the paper itself, the article. And so, you know, when I we have an option, the Stanford Digital Repository, if you put your data in there to create, it's not required, but to create a citation for this data set. And people look at me really confused. And I some of them I just I cannot explain to them why that's not the paper. Why that's not intended. There's another place to put that citation. I mean some of them do put the paper there. They put the citation for the paper there and that is allowed. Um, but they don't, they don't see these as separate things. I think if they have a data set that isn't attached to publications or attached to publications yet, um, then they, they see the point of that. But I think it's this historical, you know, they are, they are integrally linked, one in the same, so. Anyone else have thoughts? I, mean, I think this sort of the, the point that you just made probably links to sort of general perception that the valuable thing in scholarly discourse is kind of the analysis and the argument. And I think researchers that I talk to who are more skeptical about this, they would argue, well, the analysis and the argument that's in the paper, that's the part that I want reviewed and cited, and the other part is just the supporting thing I've worked on, and therefore I want everyone to focus on the scholarly argument, and I want my students to focus on the argument, and the rest is really just a tool I need to get there, and I don't want to publish all my tools, it's about the argument. I think that may be related to what you're saying. Okay, uh, so next question is about um, kind of data, man data management more generally. Um, the question is kind of uh, where are we and, and maybe a question about who's responsible. I know that um, I didn't manage any of my data when I was a PhD student or a postdoc and um, I, I've changed that since and it's really hard um, to, to keep up with good data management practices. But um, from where I'm sitting, um, it seems like there's a lot of places you could kind of put the blame on um, on various parts of that life cycle in terms of who's responsible, but um, does anybody want to say anything about that? Where we are, who's responsible? Anyone? Hello? I don't want to be the only one talking. Well, I'll say, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll say something. It might be dumb, but I'll, <laughs> I'll say something about it. I think, I think a lot of the stakeholders that we've mentioned are, are part of that, that data management chain um, and I think tool builders who are sort of an indirect stakeholder, sometimes they're in the community, sometimes they're not, um, are also part of that as well. So I think, I think there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of roles that are responsible for data management. Obviously, the researchers and their colleagues are responsible during the operational phases of, of their, their research, but hopefully, what we are, you know, we're starting to see with things like OSF, uh, you know, coming into the, the operational phase and helping researchers capture the data there so that it's protected in some way. Um, you know, in, in our group, the data management services, we talk to the researchers about what they should be doing uh, to protect the data. Um, when, when we start thinking about archiving it or uh, actually building the tools, we're thinking about how close we can get those tools to the researchers so we can get as much information out of them as possible while they're still thinking about the data. Um, not when they're doing the afterthought thing for them, which is, uh, you know, putting the data in the archive because they have to. Uh, I think the other thing uh, is about, um, you know, how, how we manage that data in the long term and who we think of as the stakeholders of, of, for the data in the longer term. So if you think about the researcher has an interest in the data, uh, 
during the project, and maybe they'll have a longer term interest, maybe they won't, uh, the publishers uh, and the institution have an interest in the data for a longer period of time in case there are issues like, uh, you know, fraud uh, or things like that, the institution may need to come back and get that data and do something about it. So I think there are incentives there for the institution to step up and, and play a role in data management. Yeah. Um, just sort of thinking about that question, um, one thing that surprised me when I, I came back to the UK and to the LSE was that um, there was no data management support service. But within a few months, I'd identified that we had an IMT service, obviously, but within that, there was an information um, security manager. There was a records manager who was an expert in the Data Protection Act and um, issues related to freedom of information and so on. We have uh, a research ethics officer and a research ethics process, um, and we have a... a um, um, a repository in the library for, for publications and output, but they weren't in any way connected at all. And it was only when I sort of started identifying these people, I could see how we basically had a data management support service there, but it wasn't connected in any way. So that must have been very confusing for researchers, just that the um, that there are all these sort of bits in the, in the institution, but they aren't connected in any way. Um, and still we get the case that I get emails from the research ethics office um, sent to me because they're about data management plans and so on. So there, there's, there's an issue of that. Um, I think more generally, in my experience talking to researchers, is that they often felt they were alone in this, um, that they were responsible for data management as part of funding requirement at all stages, and they weren't sort of able to connect that up to the institutional support, and that's sort of more of a general observation. Thanks. Um, Perhaps just adding to that, so as I've mentioned earlier, we, we've done a bit of surveying of researchers across the university to get a view, what is it that we need to do, where are the biggest problems? Um, not surprisingly, but it has shown us that sort of the top three places where people store their data are <clears throat> the, the machine in the office, their laptop at home, uh, and external drives of some sort, and everything that kind of cloud storage, everything else comes sort of significantly below. I mean, just kind of from looking at the consultation that we have there, I think, um, in terms of certainly sort of the basics of curation, just having your data stored somewhere where the chances of losing it is relatively low. Um, <clears throat> if the university I work for is kind of reflects any of the others, which I think anecdotally from what I hear it does, then we aren't very far on that point. And picking up the part about support, I mean, I agree that we probably can all do better having a good support offer, but there's also a feeling from the researchers that they're sort of left alone by the funders. The funders will say, you have to do this, you can apply for funding, but at the same time, researchers indicate they are concerned to do it because they say, well, if I do this properly, it's going to cost 50,000. If I add 50,000 onto this grant, they're probably rejecting it because it would just look like it's not good value. So even where there is a route where they could actually get more support in, they're concerned to do it because they're afraid of reviewers who would just mark this down, not understanding how difficult it actually is. We've just done at Imperial a pilot project where we funded six sort of green shoots RDM projects to help get a bit of internal discussion going, understand the needs. And it was really interesting to look at the projects, but one of the sort of the feedback that we got from some people high up in the organization is like, this looks really good, but if we scale this up across the whole organization, we'll just be broke. There's no way we can support this. And if you combine this with the feeling the institution can't fund it, uh, it's too dangerous to go to the funders. Uh, and then you look at where people currently store their data and how they manage it, then I think for this one, I'm definitely coming down on the way too slow answer. OK, we're at our 15-minute mark, but I'm just going to give one more opportunity for anyone to final comments on any of, of what Torsten said or Tim. Yeah, I, I would just add one thing to that. Even if the researchers aren't scared uh, to go back to the funder f for the issue of it's not good value, uh, you know, usually there's a limit on the request for any particular award. And the amount of money that you would spend, you could pay one or two grad students and have them in your lab. And, you know, well, <laughs> I think we know what any researcher is going to want to do. <laughs> But again, I think this fundamentally gets down to the fact that we are trying to um, ask people to pull uh, funding that is basically for infrastructure and operational things out of their research grants. 
Um, and as long as we're doing that, then there is going to be resistance. If people say, you know, if researchers um, and, you know, funders recognize this, if you talk this to a fund, talk to a funder and you say, um, you know, why on earth don't you take a percentage of your budget um, and put it into infrastructure, which you clearly need, they'll say, well, but that will be taking it out of the research pool. Um, and so I'm increasingly wondering whether the issue isn't that, you know, um, okay, well, taking one or two percent out of somebody's budget, uh, a particular funder's budget to, to, to fund this infrastructure um, could be a very difficult case to make. But clearly all funders have this problem. Um, and the question I have is why aren't funders actually working together to say, look, we all have problems with actually providing common storage identifiers and metadata services at the most basic level across our systems. Um, and if each of us puts in a fraction of our budget, it's not a huge amount out of our research budget. Researchers won't see too much of a change, but we'd actually be able to fund something that actually worked across disciplines, across you know, uh, the other various silos that we've talked about. Okay, and I think this microphone is supposed to go out into the audience. So while somebody grabs it, I'm gonna let Torsten make a final comment. Yeah, I just kind of strongly support what you said. I mean, we've been looking into, can we maybe as an institution say, we just build the infrastructure, but then the problems that you come up with in the way this is funded um, is that it then goes on something which not everyone may be familiar with called our indirect cost. There's sort of the way how research is costed in the UK. And there's a risk if we say, well, we just do all of this, um, that then in the way this is later on accounted, the funders will just say, well, you're not very run very efficiently as a university because you're really expensive supporting the infrastructure, and they'll just cut it right off. So that's the, the concern coming in from the university's point of view. And if also, if we all do it individually, uh, it's much more expensive than if there was actually a proper shared service supporting this. Okay, okay, audience, questions, comments? Oh, I was trying to think of a theme that Wait, was emerging. say your name and who you oh, are. Robin Rice, University of Edinburgh. I was trying to think of a theme that was emerging other than carrots and sticks and weapons. Um, and I thought of a uh, tipping point because um, we had Tony Hay pointing out the, that there might be a tipping point at the international or government policy level and what Tim, I think, was saying about um, some disciplines have already reached a tipping point, but not others. And I was wondering um, what people on the panel think with their <coughs> experience with researchers, if there's a tipping point for individual researchers. Because I wonder if, um, peop uh, if you find that people who, once they've deposited data once or published <coughs> data once, then it becomes not a big deal after that, or does that is that not the case? And if so, how do you get them, an individual, over the tipping point? So um, I'll just say that there is a pattern that we detect, and I, I you know to draw this back a little again to infrastructure. I'm afraid, but um, infrastructure isn't uh, useful until it's useful. Uh, that sounds ridiculous, but. Um, when you're building infrastructure, you have to have a certain critical mass um, before it actually starts working. And so, um, you know, to a certain degree with a lot of infrastructure projects, they're faith-based until they're actually developing, uh, until people are actually using it. With Crossref, for instance, um, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, nobody knew what a DOI was. Um, and when Crossref started, um, clearly DOIs were kind of useless to people because um, there weren't enough of them uh, to make a difference. Um, and what we found is that after about three years or so, uh, with any sort of infrastructure project we've done since then, whether it's been uh, CrossCheck or CrossMark or now ORCID, um, there's, there seems to be about a three-year period um, where everybody is participating in it because they see a long-term value in it, but it's not actually delivering that value. Um, and then after about three years, when you get a critical mass, it starts to pay dividends, and then it starts to actually, um, um, it actually starts to, 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 to show promise. Um, so this, this issue that you're talking about, is there a tipping point? I think there certainly is in some of these projects. Um, and then, you know, and tying this back to funding, one of the things that funders have to do is recognize that uh, and not fund things on two-year cycles if it's going to take three to four years for something to actually uh, show benefit to the community. Uh, I would just, I'd just add one thing, and that's, uh, you know, in the experiences that uh, we've had in our group, we've seen 
We've seen uh, people who become more sophisticated as they uh, have more experiences, and we've seen people who don't. Uh, and and I, I think that has something to do with the way their teams are formed. So, you know, within a lab at, a, at one moment, there might be one set of students and they might be responsible for a lot of the activities and, and the researcher, uh, the PI is more hands off. Uh, and so a, as new people come in, they have different practices and those aren't being monitored. So, you know, just like uh, I was mentioning before about each of these stakeholders is different. Uh, I think each one of these researchers, especially in the long tail where there's not uh, sophistication in, the, in their community, they're all different. We, we just don't know what they're going to do. We don't know what the next experience is going to be. Is there a successful example, and the one I'm thinking of is the American Economic Association for decades has asked people to deposit data, and 20 years ago the situation was a disaster. And about 10 years ago they started really twisting authors' arms, and apparently things were much better uh, in the sense that most authors do deposit the data, and they deposit enough information that somebody told to go try to use it can. So is that a message that, yeah, things will improve if we bear with it, or are they exceptional? Michael Lesk. I, I don't know whether there's any direct correlation, but I do know that, for instance, um, uh, there have been a number of organizations, other organizations, that have uh, 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 really pushed data deposit, including uh, things like the OECD and World Bank, um, and I, and I, it seems to me that in that particular um, uh, field, economics, where you've got, you know, uh, uh, where you've got things like REPEC and so on and so forth, there does seem to be a sort of a, a more, uh, an openness uh, to, to sharing data and providing things that perhaps hasn't existed in other disciplines. So it might have been right for it. It also could have just been a critical mass as if between having things in the OECD and World Bank and IMF made public. Um, you know, possibly could it set an example and helps um, do that. You look dubious. <laughs> it took two years to get Reinhardt and Rogoff to turn over the spreadsheet that was the basis of the growth stops at 90%, when debt is 90% of GDP, and then to have it discovered that in fact they have boxed themselves. <laughs> 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 the well, why do you think it took so long? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's interesting um, if we kind of sort of compare this to open access to look at which funders have been sort of more or less successful. And I mean, the Wellcome Trust is a good example. They've been at this for ten years. They've only now kind of moved towards around seventy percent compliance, and they pay for everything. Um, there's no concern as a researcher that if you publish more articles, it will have any negative effect. They've only now started also putting sanctions in. And so I think that kind of gives us an indication of how long, even if a funder is sort of driving this really dedicated way, how long that kind of change can take. And even now, only about two thirds. <laughs> okay. Hello, Graham Blythe, University of Leeds. I'd like to ask quite a different sort of question. To what extent do the panel think we are part of the problem? In that maybe we've never really decided what the it is or looks like. Is there a version one of data management that we could define and deliver rather than keeping on doing cleverer and cleverer things and never letting it stand still? Um, I think the best definition I heard when it came to data, well, not data management, but data reusability was, I think it was Gary King, that um, would someone else be able to understand this data set without having to ask you, as the original data collector, um, what it meant? And I don't see that we need to move much further beyond that in terms of definition of what research data management is. It's just about telling the story of data. 
think um, I think that we've probably been uh, paradoxically too ambitious and too conservative. Um, too ambitious, perhaps, in uh, trying to be uh, all-encompassing for either specific disciplines or institutions or funding agencies, um, and too conservative in not recognizing, where, whereas actually what we should do is just look for truly a least common denominator that allows people to at least get the data up in a place where people can find it. Um, and then to uh, conservative in that we focused on our niches, um, our libraries, our institutions, our, uh, our countries. Um, and that, in fact, should be global. So I, th I, I feel like a combination of um, pulling it out of silos um, and making it simpler um, to actually submit metadata um, might, might, might do the trick. Um, I'd like to say that uh, I, I, I totally agree with that. I, I really think that we need to aim for simpler. So I have these conversations with librarians at Stanford a lot where um, we require a pretty minimal set of metadata for depositing data into the Stanford Digital Repository. And, and it's amazing how, with very few required fields, how poorly that can be done. <laughs> it doesn't really bother me. It really bothers a lot of other librarians. And it, the reason it doesn't bother me is because I feel like we're, we're at the early stages of helping people develop good habits. And you usually don't do things very well the first time you do them. But if you get in the habit of doing it, then you, you'll end up doing it, I think you'll do it better um, over time. And also the point that if people go looking for that data and they find it, and it doesn't have adequate descriptive information associated with it, then they will come and ask that person for more. Um, and and they, the re original researcher will then in this sort of circular way, learn what they really need to be putting up in order to make it understandable to other people. I mean, I've sat in the room with people who said, I said, do you have uh, descriptions of all of your column headers? And they said, oh, well, they're just, you know, A, B, and C, so they're completely self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. And it was, and I'm a scientist, and it was complete, you know, gobbledygook to me. Um, it was not self-explanatory. Um, and, and sometimes they argue with us. You know, we ask them for something that, that is readable by an intelligent person who discovers that entry in our library catalog and they won't do it. Um, and for me, it's fine. But, but I think you need to start by making it easier. But start by saying we need all of these metadata fields. We need, we need to make it so it's completely understandable by anyone. I, I mean, I think, I think it's too much to start with, especially if we're having the researchers do it themselves. I've spent a few years looking after a digital humanities project database. <clears throat> uh, that was meant for people who think sort of digital humanities should understand digital projects and metadata. Um, the project database was fairly well defined with an on, well, almost ontology built in and everything. And the amount of metadata that, we, that I've seen there that was actually correct or useful was very minimal because I think the feeling was it was just too many fields. So the, the one thing I've learned from that point of view is agreeing with what you say, keep it to the minimum you absolutely need, see that we can get that right. But also, I think, be careful spending too much time having an abstract discussion trying to define it. As I was mentioned earlier, I've spent quite a bit of time in the digital humanities field, and that's a field that even now, after a few decades, sometimes seems to spend more time talking about what it actually means to do digital humanities as opposed to doing it. I'm, I'm allowed to say that because I've sort of come from that area, <laughs> and I'd really like us to avoid and rather focus on getting a few concrete things done because then we can start demonstrating the benefits. Okay. I'm going to lean awkwardly and ask the panel one last question, which uh, I told them I was going to ask them, so they should be prepared. Sweet. Thanks. Okay. Um, the rapid fire, rapid fire answer to the question, if you had the power to accomplish one thing to move this field forward, some sort of magical superpower, what would you do? Go for it. And I've given three points earlier. I'm not going to repeat them instead I say something else. I'd like to be able to go to any researcher in the university and have a convincing cost-benefit argument that why RDM is useful and why they should create data. Um, <coughs> I would be happy if the funders would be more restrictive or um, give more advices what to do and check um, data management plans, for example, and not just give the idea or the recommendation to do things, but even to check what they're doing. 
Kate's been mentioned um, already, but yeah, clear term terminology um, would be the one thing. Um, open access doesn't mean open data. Um, open data doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as data reuse. Um, how those terms are understood outside our community can be problematic. Um, actually, open access has made my life a bit more difficult in some ways because um, open access messages of um, being available to anyone for any use um, often get mixed up with data sharing, which um, can mean um, anyone for any use. But a lot of social science data, certainly uh, when I was at the UK Data Archive, um, is not open to anyone for any use for very legitimate reasons. And that worries researchers who, um, as one said to me, believe their data would be on Google. So I think I've said uh, most of the things that I'd, I'd like to see happen. I think the big issue is culture and incentives. And I think alignment of incentives wherever possible is going to be uh, a really key thing. And, and I think this issue of how, how we actually talk about what we're doing, um, this vocabulary issue that we have, I think is going to be very important in that discussion. Well, I was going to say um, automagic generation of complete and accurate metadata for everyone, but I actually really like the cost benefit um, you know, analysis. So. You pay I, I'm only gonna... postage and handling. <laughs> Um, even with the right <clears throat> attitude, um, I think that there's still a lot of infrastructure missing, and I would urge um, us to stop thinking that infrastructure is going to emerge as a byproduct of the research process and that infrastructure can be funded on soft money and grant cycles. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so just a reminder that um, obviously this panel has lots of great ideas, so allow this to kind of seed your discussions over the next couple of days and feel free to bug them. I'm just going to volunteer them to talk about this more <laughs> over the next couple of days. So thanks, everybody, for your...